Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm pleased here. to be here. Thank you. Well, I'm here today with Rep former Representative Thomas McClovick, who represented the 35th District from Allegheny County, serving from 1979 to 2002. Right. Could you start off by telling us what kind of experiences um, in your early childhood um, with your family life prepared you for public service? Uh, I think the biggest effect from my uh, childhood was almost one of in a family of 11. And so, um, and I was one of the younger, uh, I was the ninth of the le uh, 11 children. And uh, so you were always uh, sharing, uh, you were always uh, squabbling and uh, trying to f fight for your share of whatever the goodies were, whether it was a, a meal or a, uh, you know, some other benefit. And um, I was fortunate to live in a mill town in North Braddock, and uh, the mill workers were walk to work. And and uh, those times, uh, I was born in 1946, the first year of the baby boomers. Uh, there were kids all over our neighborhood. And so we had a gang of kids in the neighborhood, and I somehow uh, was the leader. I was the leader of that gang of kids, and we played ball, and, and I made a lot of decisions, whether we played base, uh, baseball or softball, or whether we were going up the hill to play Army, or whether we were going to do this or that. And um, I, I didn't realize that at the time, but I had an affinity for leadership. And um, Years later, um, I, you know, when I went uh, through high school, I came out of high school and started in a job in a soils engineering company. I was a surveyor. I had had technical training in high school. I was a surveyor, draftsman, that kind of thing. And um, in the course of that, I got this job, and uh, we were building steel mills, and the Vietnam War was going on. And um, I got a deferment, a critical skills deferment, because we were building steel mills were, which were important to the war effort. And uh, so I worked there for a couple of years, and um, my boss said, you know, you're too bright to be just an assistant. You've got to go to college, and if you don't go to college, I'm going to have you fired. You know, and I knew he wasn't serious, but I, I never really um, had anybody that said, you know, you're too bright to be here. You need to go to, you know, you need to move on to the next phase. And so I had saved some money. I said, yeah, let's do it. And I signed up for a school, Davis and Elkins in West Virginia. And I went down there uh, with an eye toward an engineering degree. But um, in my first week there, uh, I was elected as the, the president of the uh, uh, the dormitory to uh, sit on uh, student government. And again, I realized I had an affinity for this thing. I, I, I had the talents to get along with people. Coming from a big family, it was always easy for me to talk to people and get along with them. And uh, I also realized I didn't really like engineering that much. I, in my job prior to that, we would build, work all kind of hours, and I'd be working and building a bridge, and then you'd be done with the project, and breathe, and then you'd be on to the next one. And I couldn't commit my life to building, you know, roads and a bridge or a building or something. Uh, ironically, I spent the same amount of time in my later life going to meetings, but I never had a problem with that. And so I guess I was just made for, you know, serving people and working with people. It was. Uh, what I was meant to do. Well, I, I got drafted out of, because I moved into college and I was drafted and went to the war. And um, went over there and was wounded, uh, received the Purple Heart and came back and uh, finished out my military uh, duty and uh, came back. Now I had money to go to college the rest of the way. I wound up at the University of Pittsburgh got a degree in political science because I realized that I wanted to do politics. And, I, you know, in the mid-60s, the whole thing of policy and questioning policy was fomenting. Actually, these were the late 60s, early 70s. And uh, so I went and got a political science degree and then uh, furthered that with I hadn't run out of my, my uh, 
uh, money from the GI Bill, so I got a graduate degree in public administration with an eye toward uh, public office. And as I was getting that, I was looking around to see which, which office and which job I should run for and uh, realized that the legislature was the lowest, that was a fully paid full-time position, and that's what I wanted to do. And so I spied my legislator. I found him, of course, in those, with that ambition, I found him to be wanting <laughs> and um, decided to uh, take it on. I ran and lost. And uh, at the time, too, uh, this was right after Watergate, uh, the early, mid-'70s. And I um, was working with Common Cause. I was one of the institutors, along with my colleague, uh, Alan Kukovich, to set up Pennsylvania Common Cause. And at the time, that organization was organized by a congressional district. When we were meeting here in Harrisburg, and I got in involved with state legislation, and we were setting up the state thing. And um, so I was kind of from getting familiar with Harrisburg. Well, I, I ran against my uh, opponent, a, a gentleman by the name of A.J. Valiceni, called Speedo, Speedo Valiceni. And um, I lost. And uh, one of the people I had met here in those common cause efforts uh, worked on an insurance committee, and I applied for a job here. I received the job, and I was working for two weeks, and uh, I bumped into Speedo on an elevator. And uh, he looked at me, and he said, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I have a job with the insurance committee. And he said, oh, no, you don't. They had me fired. I worked for two weeks, got one paycheck and a pink slip, and I was gone. And instead of just going home and brooding about it, I went home and said, called a press conference. I said, Speedo Valiceni had me fired. He took my job. I'm going to take his. And from that day on, I started running against him. And uh, I took a very different and uh, aggressive, more aggressive approach, not just talking about what a nice guy I am, and what it, but I went after his record. And... Um, uh, developed a technique. Uh, I showed you campaign materials earlier of delivering um, my message through school kids. Uh, and uh, I had a fellow teacher who offered all of his kids extra credit if they would work for a candidate, any candidate. And of course, I made it easy for those kids to work. And I would take them out on a Saturday with a couple of my buddies and We'd each get in the car, three or four kids, and we would just um, go through a neighborhood and deliver literature to every one of theirs. And three weeks, two, three weeks later, we'd have another piece of literature, a different one, with another story. And we did that four times in that district. So we got everybody a message four times. Then I had a mailing, which was a fifth time. And um, we won the election. And that's my story how I got here. Could you comment on the demographic makeup of the of your district? Sure. Um, my district was a um, uh, union labor district. I had the United States Steelworkers uh, in my district, the Braddock uh, plant, which is still operating today as we tape this uh, some uh, two decades later. Uh, it was the first integrated steel mill in the country. And um, that town, Braddock, was also the home of the Braddock Carnegie Library, which was the first Carnegie Library of the 1400 that Andrew mm -hmm. Carnegie built around this country. So it's a town, and it is also the, the location where, of the infamous Braddock's defeat, where uh, George Washington was first uh, uh, showed the stuff of leadership. Uh, some 250 years ago as we as we sit here so um, that was uh, that bill was there and there was also the Westinghouse plant and in the Westinghouse plant was the first broadcasting ra uh, commercial radio broadcast in the country with KDK um, and it was the first there right near there is a little um, um, nuclear uh, 
planet. It was little, it's like a little globe that's set up on a hill in Chalfont. And it was the first location of a atomic uh, plant in the country. Uh, a lot of history right around there. And it was a working class place. Westinghouse built large rotating uh, these uh, big turbine engines that opened with doors of uh, locks and dams and the Panama Canal and all of this stuff. And so um, there was a lot of uh, history there. And, and the workers um, were my, I considered them my constituents and my prime uh, source of uh, my constituency. In fact, one of the ways that I won this election, remember my opponent at the time was the president of the union down at the, at the steelworks. Um, in the morning, I would go to those steel, uh, steel mill plants and shake their hands and ask for their vote. And they say, I will never see you after the election. I'll give you a vote, but we'll never see you. And the day after the election, I was there that morning thanking those guys. I ran from the, the steel mill up to the Westinghouse plant. And uh, with the universal comment, we never saw anybody come back and say thanks. And I think that thank you, um, which I did after each election, um, that thank you served me as much for re-election as anything I did in the next campaign. And uh, I think it was an important technique. Did the district change over the years at all? Absolutely. In the early 80s, 1982, if I recall, they started the uh, steel shutdown. And uh, you had the Homestead plant was shutting down, the Duquesne plant was shutting down, McKeesport was shutting down. Now, they weren't all in my district then. I think Duquesne was. Um, at the time, and McKeesport, part of, I had a little part of McKeesport at the time. Uh, but they affected workers throughout the valley, throughout the region. And uh, so we began uh, going to a lot of meetings where, you know, people were demanding action from government. What do, and what do you do? I mean, it's a, a private company saying we're shutting this plant down. Um, and so um, we began taking a serious look along with a great deal of help from the International Union of the United Steel Workers. And we set up this group called uh, Tri-State Conference on Steel. And from that uh, group, we began looking at the process of eminent domain in Pennsylvania law, and maybe taking over a plant and running it with the workers, with making an investment out of uh, some of the pension monies or some of the monies available to the U.S. Uh, steel Workers Union. And uh, out of that came the Steel Valley Authority, of which I still am vice president today, some 20 some years later. And uh, we have a program that just expanded here to central Pennsylvania, um, which is the uh, SOAN project, the Strategic Early Warning Network. And we go out and we send uh, uh, consultants out and review companies uh, that are either going to change hands, the, the owner is getting old, looks to be moving on, um, or companies that are in trouble. And we try to work with them and get, get help for them. Um, and so those are, and back then, uh, we were just attending meetings about these issues and trying to help steel workers keep their jobs. But out of it came a whole system of a remedy for other plants later on, not for those steel works. Uh, in the one case, uh, there was a rather famous blast furnace called Dorothy Six in the early 80s, and it was in the Duquesne plant. And it won the award just the year prior to for being the most productive blast furnace in you know, in the U.S. Steel's whole system. And they were shutting it down the next year. And, it, I mean, those guys were just so angry. And uh, part of what we did was with this Tri-State Conference on Steel and then the Steel Valley Authority, is we were able to, uh, with some of the resources, Steelworkers Union, to engage a consultant off of Wall Street, Lazard Frere, who came down and did a uh, feasibility study of whether or not we could make this work. Because if we could, we were going to take it over by eminent domain. And they came back and said, no, you can't. You just can't make money in this plant. And um, the fact that 
it was their consultant. It was their, you know, he was coming by and, and honestly telling them that no, that this plant can't make them money in today's market. Uh, the steel workers bought it. Uh, actually, we had guys threatening with guns to sit up in the hills and, and shoot at truck drivers coming in to dismantle the plant. So it was a very, very hot situation. And uh, through this uh, feasibility study, we were able to kind of get folks to settle down and realize that that was the end of that plant. And today we have all new businesses on that plant. Still sits on the river. We have a, the Pets, west of Pennsylvania, the Greater Pittsburgh Community Food Bank on that plant, serving 22 counties. Um, so we moved on. Change happened. But it wasn't fun while we were doing it. Was that one of your hardest issues? Oh, yes. Uh, guys losing their jobs and their careers and, um, y you know, they're, they're young. They're in their 30s and 40s. Uh, they have to a real change of life. Uh, uh, they didn't know anything else. Uh, that's, that's awfully tough. It was one of the toughest times in my career. And about that same time, I had the Woodland Hills merger, the General Braddock School District, which was largely a minority uh, black population uh, was going, uh, was uh, through a lawsuit, a federal lawsuit, uh, going to be merged with the Turtle Creek, Churchill School Board, Twistville, Edgewood, all of which were white communities surrounding it. It was real, uh, very, very dicey. Um, but we were able to work through it, and uh, with my colleague, in the neighboring district who shared some of those communities with me, Ron Cowell. Um, we kept pounding away at uh, trying to improve the, the proposals and the prospects. And uh, when it was finally handed down and uh, we determined we're going to make it work, and the people did too. And um, it's been a success story. Uh, not just on the football field because they've won a number of championships, but I think it's been a success story in the school district, in, in classrooms too. And I always say those kids in the General Braddock School District, which was the minority district, had no chance. I mean, they had no chance um, that the education that at that point, and this was in the early 80s, uh, they, they just weren't getting uh, enough to go out into the world. And now they have a chance. A lot of them have succeeded. And so I'm, I'm particularly proud of sticking with it and, and taking all the help. Um, but I was fighting for those kids, uh, even with some of my own family who had kids in that other school district, you know, were, were not happy with it. Well, we talked about some of the concerns of your district. <clears throat> you were the chairman of the Allegheny County delegation for a while. Right. How are the county's concerns different from your district? Well, the, um, the, the counties, uh, there, were, there were two major entities. You got, got to understand in Allegheny County, about a third of the county, it, now it's a fourth, but then it was about a third, was the city. And so the, the city had specific interests uh, with, you know, all the uh, corporate headquarters, and they were losing population. Um, the the shopping district and, and such; those were issues that were kind of exclusive to them. Um, the county had other issues and was more involved in that time with uh, services, ch children and youth services, with mental health services, with you know the, that the state provides money for those things, but we implemented through those counties. And so um, at the time, Tom Forster uh, and uh, Pete Flaherty were the county commissioners. And uh, they were very, uh, Tom Forster was very aggressive about addressing those, those needs. And uh, I, later in his career, he had come through the Pennsylvania legislature. Uh, he was a senator. Um, but he become the, the later he moved into his career, the more he became a, an advocate of, of, of people and services to meet the needs of those people. And uh, uh, I got along with him fabulously well. And, and 
we, I think, accomplished quite a bit. I uh, was a sponsor of a bill on uh, mental health uh, uh, insurance, and it took me over 20 years to get the bill finally passed. And when it did pass, there was one vote against it on the floor of the House, and it was mine. And it was mine because it wasn't nearly what it should have been. It was just a, a, a in in my way of thinking at the time, I thought it was just a facade of a bill. After all that time, that's what we got. Um, but in my role as uh, delegation leader, I always saw it as a, um, you were a convener, and you're trying to uh, get areas of commonality and get enough votes to get something passed. and. Uh, at the time, this was uh, in the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s. Um, the steel mills had gone down now. Uh, we were rusting on the, on the sites, and people were anxious about uh, jobs, as they always are. Um, and so we had to convert those plants, those uh, sites, into real jobs. We had the land. It was right next to the water. I had the real lines to them. Um, and it, it was going to take a lot of money to do it. And uh, that was not going to come from the local government. It had to come from the state. Uh, feds weren't all that interested in doing mill site legislation at the time. And uh, so it was a matter of uh, getting into a bond issue, and we got some very large bond issues in the early 80, late 80s, early 90s to do this work, and we um, uh, negotiated. Philadelphia got a new convention center. We got $90 million for our airport which, uh, expansion, which is a now a world-renowned aer airport. And um, we also cleared some of those mill sites. I remember uh, Tom Murphy is the one that really was the, um, uh, you know, uh, most strongest advocate for getting our act together. He asked uh, the county commissioners, the mayor, uh, the university presidents, everybody who were coming to us individually, he said, you have to come up with a single plan. And they did, and they called it Strategy 21. And it wasn't really anything more than a, compilation of all of those projects, but it was a package. And in order, in order for Philadelphia to get our votes for their package, which was the convention center and some of their um, cultural amenities down the Broad uh, Street area, we wanted Strategy 21. And um, so sure enough, uh, we cut the deal, got the votes together, and uh, we started clearing the mill sites. And the, the whole uh, notion, uh, we met with uh, Dick Seyert, who at the time was the president of Carnegie Mellon. And he said, the future economy is going to be based on knowledge. It's going to be computers, and it's going to be biotech, and it's going to be you know all of these things. I didn't even know what biotech, uh, and biogenetic engineering, I, what, what's that? I didn't even know it. and. Um, he was right, and we decided that that mill site that was nearest to the universities in Oakland, which is called Second Avenue site, would be all these high-tech companies. We wouldn't allow any other kinds of companies. And if you go down there today, the software, uh, you know, not the software engineering, but the, the uh, tissue uh, engineering stuff came out of there, uh, the the high-tech uh, transportation systems with uh, uh, Webco, Webtech, and some of those plants are down there. So it, it was a plant that, that worked. It was a plant that worked. And my job was to get everybody together. And it was pretty easy in that instance. But there were other instances. I remember we came near to a fist fight over the Port Authority and changing the rules for the Port Authority of Allegheny County for the bus drivers. And uh, those of us, uh, uh, and, and remember, we're Democrats, generally pro-union. Pro I'm a, from a union district. But um, what happened when they, in the mid-60s, when they consolidated, uh, the banks had a lot of debt 
from all of these little transportation companies. And so they came up to Harrisburg, advocated to put them into one big old unit called the Port Authority to pay off their debt. Well, the banks got out with their money, but what they had was they left us a mess of old equipment, work rules that didn't work, and so you had, you know, we had work rules where guys, there had to be two guys on a, a, sh a bus or a shift or a, on a train, and, and, um, and it, they didn't fit together. And over, over the 20 years that the Port Authority had been in existence, the work rules stood against any kind of pruning and, and necessary uh, changes uh, to get into the modern world. And one of them was smaller buses. You couldn't have a small bus uh, because, you know, when they talked about a bus, they actually described the size of the bus. So w we got the small buses that go into the neighborhoods, saved on fuel, saved on um, the, the time, and we used the big buses on, uh, on the main lines, the buses, ways, and such. And uh, that fight was a terrible fight within our caucus because our delegation of about 22 Democrats was split right down in the middle. And we couldn't, it was the Democrats were in control at the time, we couldn't get agreement on it. And uh, that was a tough one. We finally won that with the coalescing with the Republicans um, and some of us uh, uh, Democrats that led the fight on that. And we had to fight our whole caucus because they, you know, the Philadelphia guys weren't going to vote, you know, take a vote against the union because they didn't have to in this instance. So those were the, uh, some of the things in the um, delegation leader. But the biggest, one of the biggest responsibilities I had was a, as a delegation leader was uh, doing the reapportionment. In 1992, it was a reapportionment year. And um, we had to lose um, two seats in Allegheny County at the time with our population. And so basically the leadership, uh, the way it works is they split out Philadelphia, they'd split out Allegheny County, and then they would work on uh, the middle part of the state and negotiate one region against the other, one district against the other. Well, uh, Alan Kukovich was in our leadership then, and he was, uh, and he was uh, put in charge of this, this task. And so the carve out for Allegheny County, I was going to take the Democratic uh, role leading the Democratic effort. And the way I did it was uh, simple. We had a guy who was extremely important to all of us. His name was Vic Willem. And Vic, uh, when I first started running, uh, helped me run my campaign with all my literature. Uh, Tom Murphy's campaign ran, helped Mike DeWita run. And after we won, we of course, got Vic to work on the next cruise, and we got Joe Markozik and Dave Marinick uh, uh, elected, and Tony DeLuca elected. And then after those guys, we got Dave Lebdansky elected, we got Ralph Kaiser elected, and, and all of these guys had used Vic Willem as their guru, as their consultant. And um, so, you know, we owed so much to Vic because he was really a brilliant guy. And uh, so we got him a job here in Harrisburg on uh, Ivan Ickett's staff, who was in, in leadership at the time. Uh, and uh, Vic uh, had, as I said, helped all of these guys get elected. So I used Vic, who they all trusted, even if they didn't trust me. And I think a lot of them trusted me, but in this issue of uh, reapportionment, you, mm -hmm. you couldn't trust anybody. But they trusted Vic because he helped them get elected. And I used Vic, and we interviewed each guy and went around and said, you know, what do you need? What do you absolutely need? What can you give up? What would you like to give up? What can't you give up? And we went through each guy. And I knew all the time uh, that there, we were going to have to lose one member. And I would ask them, if we have to lose one, Who's it got to be? And I took a, basically a, a confidential vote of that delegation. And that guy happened to be 
one of our older members who was in failing health, wouldn't admit it. Um, and uh, so we iced him out of the map. And then after doing that, he ran for Congress and lost. And so um, we were able to succeed in getting that done. But that process, uh, I think, earned me um, the respect of my fellow members of the delegation because it was a fair process. Everybody, you know, we worked it around and I developed a basic consensus and even with the member that was left out, um, it was a pretty fair process for him too. And he had, we made the decision for him to leave because he was driving up here and couldn't see and uh, he had uh, sight problems, diabetes, he had other health issues, and he wouldn't admit it, and he needed to get out of the game. Is reapportionment always fair? No. No. And, and that's, you know, I, I taught a course for some time after um, my lecture with Dave Marinick, who uh, is very uh, conservative generally. I'm very liberal, and we go into class, and we fight in front of the kids and all. We have a great time. But that's the one point that I make. Uh, when you come up here the first year, you think, oh, we, you know, we're going to do this. And wanna, you know, this doesn't work that way. We're going to change this and that. It's not about why. It's about who, what, where, and when. You know, the, the right committee, the right person, uh, the right time, uh, you know, for ideas to, to move in. and. Uh, you know, that's the hardest thing for people to get to understand is that it's not a rational process. It's not rational. It's, it's emotional. It's human. You know, there are a lot of things that come into play here that uh, do not involve uh, rationality. And that's why it's so confusing for people to see this, uh, this process. So what was it like for you the first time you saw the process on the floor? What did you think? <laughs> well, I, I, I couldn't understand how they knew where, wh what they were voting for. I mean, you know, I know there were Democrats are up on one board and they're red and Republicans are up on another board and they're green or vice versa. And, and, uh, but outside of party line, you can't be voting for a party line all the time. I knew that wasn't uh, there. And I didn't realize then the importance of the caucuses and how you go to a caucus. And uh, the staff person tells you and brings up the major issues, and you go over it, and then you get a chance to question them and, and, and give an opinion about what you think. Other members don't agree with that. And you have a big you have a debate within your own caucus about before you ever go to the floor. So when you go to the floor, you've heard it all before. I mean, oh, I, you know, so you're telling the joke and you're talking to your neighbor about this and people are watching you and they're saying, well, how, how do they know what's going on? You know what's going on because the process drives you that mm -hmm. way. Um, who are some of the members that helped you out early on in your career? Well, I, I think a lot of my uh, colleagues uh, um, that I admired most, I think, were uh, you know, essentially my contemporaries. They came in uh, with me or just a little before me. And I think that's true of every incoming class. They kind of have a bond. You know, they're going through this uh, process together. But the guys that are just a few years uh, in front of them, are the, the folks that they're closest to, and I was no different. Uh, we used to come from Pittsburgh. We would come, uh, Alan Kukovich, Ron Kalb, myself, Bill DeWeese, Frank Pastella, uh, would drive up in a single car. We'd all meet at New Stanton and pile into one guy's car and drive up and have a, a raucous time on the way up. Um, and I know other guys, uh, Murphy and DeWeese, Steve Savenny, uh, drove up every week on Sunday night. They all three drive together and talk about political stories, and uh, and so it was fun. It was fun. I think that uh, it was just so uh, en enjoyable. And then when we'd get up here, um, 
we would go through all the machinations of lawmaking and politics and lobbyists, and, and uh, then we would go out with one another and maybe play a game of tennis. And, or I didn't play golf then, but we played tennis and go to dinner together, and, and it was a very, very enjoyable uh, time. You lived with uh, several members. Right. You, you purchased a house? Yes, uh, it was called uh, Green Street, 1616 Green Street, uh, up here in Harrisburg. And uh, a number of us were um, renting, and we were all buddies. We decided the thing to do was to buy a house, let it uh, uh, evaluate over time, you know, and, and uh, then, you know, at the end of our careers, we would sell it. Well. Little did I realize that I was going to be the bookkeeper in this whole process, and uh, um, we went out to look at the houses. And Tom Murphy uh, is the guy; he loves remodeling houses, and you know. And so he says, "I got perfect place." A, a lobbyist up here, Karen Ball, had uh, guided him up in that section. It's uh, about ten blocks, fifteen blocks up from um, the Capitol, and. The first time we looked at the house, um, we're all in, in this car. We come driving down the street real slow, and then I can literally see through the front door transom, I could see sky through the, what was supposed to be a roof, and I'm thinking, oh, my God. And Ron Cow looks over, and he looks out there, and he says, I'm out. <laughs> I'm out. Forget it. You know, and, and so we said, okay, well, we'll put a roof on the thing. We'll, you know. It's a good buy. We bought it for a couple thousand, four thousand dollars, or something like that. And we put twenty-five into renovations and fixing it up. And uh, we each had a room in the house. There were three floors. We had a renter on the first floor, and then the second floor there were three rooms, and the third floor there were three rooms. And in the house was uh, uh, myself, uh, Alan uh, Kukovich, uh, Huck Campbell, Tom Murphy, Mike Dewita and Steve Savini. And of all of those folks, the, the most um, a colorful character was Steve Savini. And Steve was a guy from the South Side who liked the numbers. He loved playing the numbers. He loved gambling. You'd go to a ball game with him, and he would bet whether it was going to be a strike or a ball. <laughs> he was, you know, quarter. He, he, he just, it was in him. And he was just a wonderful guy with a, you know, wonderful positive attitude. <laughs> Um, he was a musician, and he was the life of the party because he would pull out his accordion and you know start playing. Name his tune, and he'd throw a quarter on the floor. Name his tune, and, you know. <laughs> and, and uh, so Allegheny County was the life. You know, we we'd have uh, some time off of the caucus, and we'd go over to our. Uh, we had the whole delegation in one bank of offices over here in the south office. Um, and everybody would start pouring in, and we'd be over there singing. And, and, and uh, uh, you know, these were when you have late night sessions and leadership are banging out some bill, and everybody's waiting around to do something. Mm -hmm. Well, we were always doing something fun, you know. So um, it, was a, it was a great time, and in the house allowed me to get, gain friendships and trust. Um, and there were times when, um, you know, Huck Gamble was. Extremely conservative. I'm pretty liberal. Alan, very liberal. Alan Kukovic. Uh, Murphy's pretty conservative on uh, fiscal issues and stuff. But they would vote with an amendment that I put up, or I'd vote with an amendment they put up because of a friendship. You know, the guy needed your help then, and I mean, he was your buddy. And it wasn't a major policy issue that was going to break or, you know, make or break the Commonwealth. It was, and. Um, and that's what other people don't understand. There's a lot of that that goes into every vote, every piece of legislation. Um, and the other thing that you must learn here immediately, and people don't understand, is you can never make a permanent enemy of anybody on that floor. You need their vote for the next vote. So, you know, you, you learn to get along with pe people, find your areas of commonality, and work them. I'll never forget, uh, I had uh, assault weapons ban legislation. I, I was uh, 
a Vietnam veteran shot with an assault weapon, an AK-47. And, um, I, you know, I was, there's no reason in the world, in my mind, that assault weapons ought to be on the street. We're having people killed, you know, and it's so much easier to kill with an assault weapon. And so I had this uh, amendment, and I had pictures of 40 different weapons that I was banning by name in this legislation. And I had a picture, and I put that on everybody's desk, 40 different pages of uh, assault weapons. And um, we were, it was very controversial. The, the legislature is very strongly uh, in Pennsylvania pro-gun, you know. And um, I had a colleague who I served with on the insurance committee, an older gentleman. And, uh, I, you know, about everybody on that floor, there was that guy, I just never agree with him on anything. I couldn't conceive of anything that I could agree with him on. So I got up and introduced my legislation. The first guy that got up and spoke in favor of that legislation was that guy. And I just, I was just bowled over. And it, it brought that lesson home to me again, that you never know what, you know, people think about different issues and don't take them for granted and, and never make an enemy of them. There's something that you two agree on that you don't even know about. Well, what were, what were the major issues with the assault weapons ban that you were trying, that, what, what, well, what were I people mean, opposed to it? The, Explain you know, it the, to me. The National Rifle Association was opposed to it. Right. It's who, what, where, and when. Okay. And uh, the who was the National Rifle Association was opposed. A lot of members were ne very nervous about that, um, ever taking a vote against them. Um, now, now, there were a lot of members that believed the, the you know, the uh, Second Amendment has no uh, limits and, and all of that, but uh, a lot more are concerned about the National Rifle Association, uh, in my mind. So that was the big thing. And, uh, and you fought that fight for many years. Many years. I, I think that the one time I got about 55 or 60 votes on my assault weapon ban. You know, kept so. trying, though. Pardon? You kept trying, though. Kept, you you got to keep trying. Um, okay. Later in your career, did you serve as a mentor to anyone? Yes. Um, young guy came to my office one day and wanted to challenge uh, an incumbent. And I, yeah, I was very strong about this. I would not, you know, one of my colleagues, I would not, whether or not I agreed him or, with him or liked him, I, w I would not get into that business. One of my Democratic colleagues, because the Republicans, yeah, yeah, they're putting up candidates against you, you've got to do the same against them. And, um, but, uh, this young guy was going to take on a Democrat, and I just, I said, I can't do this publicly. The only thing I will do is I'll give you the name of this guy, and you talk to him and see if he's interested. In, and, and at that time, Vic Willem didn't work here. Mm -hmm. He was still back home working as a consultant where he could. And so I gave him Vic's number, and Vic uh, took on that campaign, and they won, and they, they, so Dave now has served over 20 years in the House. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I always called him the rookie uh, and uh, gave him a lot of guff, but I admired his courage. He came in that first year when we were in that terrible fight over the Port Authority, and he stuck with us, even though he, too, was from a union district, and uh, I always admired him for that. How did you work with both Democratic and Republican leadership? to resolve legislative issues? Um, I, I, don't, I don't know if you work with, with leadership. I'm not even sure the, the okay. question is phrased uh, properly. You work with your colleagues on both sides. You know, over time, I, 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 and it doesn't take long, you establish who you are and what you're about up here. And I was about a clean environment, a clean government. And... Um, I was uh, about those kinds of issues. I was uh, labor-oriented. Um, people know that. They may not agree with it. They may vote against uh, stuff like that, but they respect you for that view. I think uh, you're here not too long 
before you realize that everybody is a product of their own environment, their own neighborhood, their own district. And uh, they're representing those people. And um, so um, I would, uh, you know, I'd, I'd take positions that people would know that uh, you know, this is an environment I know where McClovich's going to be on this. And, uh, um, but they also knew that I studied the issue. I, I was honest about it. I wasn't doing it for any, um, quote, nefarious reason, a campaign contribution or, a, you know, some, they, they felt I was voting for it because I believed in it. And uh, that is, you know, where you want to be, to my mind, is where you really we want to be. You have your respect of your colleagues for your position. And in turn, you respect theirs. Could you comment on the changes in party leadership through the years? Um, when I came in, um, my first vote was in caucus. It's a vote for leadership. And uh, prior to the vote, uh, everybody's um, maneuvering to be this position or that position. And at the time, uh, Irvis and Mandarino, Mandarino was going to challenge Irvis for a speaker. Uh, and they went we through this whole thing. And these were two of the most powerful people in the state. And, you know, they're calling you one day, one call, the next day, you're right. Yeah. And I said to Mandarino, I said, Jim, I'm from Allegheny County. I'm with Leroy. And Leroy was, uh, you know, an icon in Allegheny County as a legislator. And, uh, you know, he says, okay, I, I respect that. And so um, after they made it go through all of that, they, they, they wind up at the last minute, the 11th hour, of making up their differences. Libra was going to be the speaker. Mandarino is going to be the majority leader. But Mandarino is going to have all the power. And Libra would have a bunch of jobs and stuff. And I was ticked. I mean, they made us go through that. I was ticked, you know. And so uh, my first vote up here, I voted against Leroy Irvis for speaker, and I voted against Jim Mandarino in caucus, you know, uh, for, for a majority leader. And I'll never forget, I was sitting there, and um, they say, you know, and everybody in the caucus is happy because it's big. They don't have to vote against these guys, you know. So all in favor of voting Leroy, aye. No. And everybody says, <laughs> hell is that guy? And, you know, and then, you know, they go through the same process for majority leader. We have Jim Mandarino. Uh, everybody in favor? Aye. And he knows? No. You know. <laughs> and like, oh, my God, that guy's nuts. This guy's crazy. that's your crazy. first vote? Yeah, that was my first vote in caucus. So a little while later, I feel this weight on my shoulder. It's big Jim Mandarino has his elbow on my shoulder and he says, you're not going to do that on the floor, are you? <laughs> he said, no, Jim, I'll, I'll vote Democrat here. I'm not going to do that. But uh, he, I, of all the people that I've served, the leaders that I've served with, um, Jim Mandarino by far, and I think you will find it, anybody that comes into my generation will say, by far Jim Mandarino was uh, uh, the, the best leader we ever had. He had a real empathy with people, with the people we were serving. He had the thick skin of a rhino. Uh, in fact, I once called him a rhino in, in caucus. He called, he used to slaughter my name, and I was very particular about my name, getting my name right, Tom McClovick. Everybody called him Miklovic, Mik Mishlovic, uh, you know, and they would slaughter him, particularly the speaker, Jack Seltzer, who was Republican the time, and, and uh, it got so that he would go to his aide and say, how do you say his name? He'd say, McClovick, you know, or Mr. McClovick, you know, and, and I'd say, Mr. McClovick, Mr. Smisher. And so everybody knew I was particular about my name. I wanted them to get to say it right up front. And so one time, uh, we're taking a caucus vote on a, I don't know, pay raise or a gas tax or some tough vote, and they're trying to get a read, and they're going through the the list of names, and uh, Mandarino is going down and says, Miklovic, and he knew about it, I says, and I said, uh, the vote is no, 
Mr. Mandarino, uh, Mr. Mandarino, and everybody in the caucus cracked up. They were just on the floor because, and you know, I I gave it back to him, and he was mature enough to say he didn't, wouldn't get mad over something like that. And I, I that's one thing I appreciate with Mandarino is his maturity. Um, he knew who was working hard. I, I got a call from one day. He said, Tom, can you use ten thousand dollars for your local office. I, I, I hadn't even asked them. I said, absolutely, you know, so I could get another staff person and do more constituent service and work. And, uh, but he didn't give that to everybody. He gave it to the guys that he knew it were, you know, in trouble or were working hard and didn't put as much time and, you know, handling constituent stuff, needed help with staff to do that because they were working on bills in Harrisburg and stuff. And he, uh, you know, he would give you the run. If you, we, uh, Murphy, Dewey, and I were all on the insurance committee. And we were, his, we were his hound dogs on that committee. And he fed us staff, and he let staff go to us because, you know, uh, we were after the right thing. And a walk, uh, Bill Walkup and Joe Hoffel were on the uh, uh, health and welfare committee. And he had to keep... Um, leaders, he, he knew we had chairmen that were too close to the industry and were too susceptible to being there, and he would stick the young guys on them. And, but he was smart enough to do that. And, uh, and Leroy Arbus was a, the, the you know, finest orator perhaps I've ever seen in my career. Could give a speech at the drop of a, of a dime. But uh, Jim Mandarino was the leader. There's no question about that. Um, the later leaders, um, uh, uh, Bill DeWeese, I, um, I always liked Bill personally. I never, and he tells me to this day every time he sees me, I never voted for him. You're the only guy that never voted for me. I like you, but you never voted for me. And I, I, I didn't feel Bill had one to, leadership qualities necessary to, um, I don't think he had the empathy for people and issues. He, he wasn't interested in issues. And you can't be a leader and not be worried about your troop. And um, so those were my assessments. And uh, I mean, your earlier question about how do you work with leadership, mm -hmm. um, I think you, you do your job on the committee and become, you gain a reputation and an understanding and they begin to rely on you. I, I can't tell you the number of times I came out of the men's room uh, on running on the floor. There's a vote going on in education. I would look to Ron Kyle's. Well, how's Ron voting on this? And I would vote. I, I didn't listen to the whole debate and you know the, the arcane issues involved in that. And I'm, you know, I didn't have the committee background and, uh, and knowledge on that issue, so I voted with somebody I trusted. Well, you served on many committees while you were here. Oh, yeah. Could you describe some of the important issues or aspects of your committee work uh, throughout your tenure, um, some of them being Veterans Affairs and Emergency Preparedness? Well, I, I, I was lucky in my career later. Um, uh, but let me tell you, I, I had served um, mm, probably about 10 terms, 20 years, and I still wasn't the chairman. And there were people in the other class, the whole role around Harrisburg is generally seniority, you, with few exceptions and, and almost no exceptions. People were named to committees based upon their being the next in line in seniority. And that's a, probably a wise process because it's an understandable and it's an easy process. You don't get into all kinds of problems and fights over it. And when my turn came up, um, Bill Deweese, who was leader, named um, groups, uh, guys in the class behind me to chairmanship. And it wasn't just me. It was Frank Pastella, who was also from Allegheny County, and, and uh, Gaynor Cawley, and, and Tom Tighe, I believe. And so um, at the time, we had some... Um, members, uh, primarily Dave Meredith and Ralph Kaiser, Harry Retroff, who were close to uh, the Republicans, John Purcell, and they were working with them. Well, 
And then he said, no, we're not going to let this happen. And we went and got an arrangement with the Republicans to vote with us to require seniority be the basis of committee chairmanship uh, in the rules of the House. It, wasn't, it would take it out of being a caucus issue. So soon after that happened, he had to name me to a committee, and I got uh, tourism. And it's a committee that nobody wanted. But my God, we had, there were so many issues, filmmaking. You know, we went to uh, Hollywood with the governor to promote films. Uh, we went to, uh, to towns all over the state to see what historic aspects they had, what uh, tourism assets they had. And it was a wonderful committee, and Bob Godshall, who I disagreed with on guns, oh, just, he was, the, you know, the most vociferous gun um, battler on, on that floor. Always we battled on that issue, but here I was, I was the minority chair on his committee. We got along fabulously well, and um, I think it, we did a lot of good work. We, we worked on the issue there of... Uh, the state parks, lodges in state parks, and trying, and they're still working on that today. Um, and so the next term after tourism became popular, everybody wanted that committee. I was bounced off of that committee because I never voted for Bill. You know. uh, the least. So then um, I uh, was assigned to Veterans and Emergency Preparedness Committee. And uh, I, I really didn't want that committee, even though I was a veteran. And I understand being a veteran, I, w I was appropriate to be named there. Um, but it taught me another lesson, even later in my career. There is no bad committee. There is no bad committee. I mean, there's important work to be done in all of these committees. And uh, shortly after I was named chairman, 9-11 uh, happened. And all of this uh, work needed to be done on communication systems and emergency uh, communications, uh, security and emergency preparedness, and volunteer fire companies, emergency medical systems, hospitals, uh, ability to be uh, equipped with uh, to deal with catastrophes. And I'm sitting right in the middle of it again. And so I say, there's just no bad committee. You just, uh, you wait the right time, and that's a very important committee. What legislation or issues did you feel were your most important? We've talked on, about several. So. Well, uh, very early on, I had my um, uh, my community mental health uh, director uh, came to me and asked me to sponsor this bill. And I said, well, where is it? And he said, well, it's House Bill 4. I said, I want to read it. And he says, he's never had anybody ask him to read the bill, <laughs> you know. And so he... I got the bill and, and I read it and I, I said, okay, and, and he asked me to see if he could, I could find out some information when it's going to move. And the prime sponsor of the legislation was a, uh, an older gentleman uh, named Amos Hutchinson from Greensburg. And uh, I went over to Amos and I said, Amos, is anything going on with this bill? He says, no, I've been putting that bill in for a long time and it hasn't been going anywhere. He says, you want it? He says, why don't you put your... You know, so he gives me this bill. Oh, I was a young guy. I was, oh, this is going to be great. So I put it in, fine, and put it in the committee, got a bunch of co-sponsors, and I'm asking the chairman when it's coming up. 20 years later, <laughs> it literally took 20 years, probably um, uh, dozens of hearings, public hearings on legislation. We got some... Uh, mental health uh, uh, coverage, and even then I voted against it because it wasn't nearly uh, good enough. Uh, I was big. I was on the uh, conservation committee then, and uh, in fact, I uh, sponsored a bill to um, have a special investigation of Dick Thornburg uh, as, as governor because of coal mine operations and uh, campaign contributions and such. Well, um, we did get the committee. We gave it subpoena power. We went out for investigate, but Bud changed the whole uh, complexion of the issue from um, coal mining abuses because he's sitting up there in the coal mine fields, and a lot of those big coal operators were 
not happy with their being investigated. But we had plenty to investigate, and we wound up investigating uh, landfills and um, went all over the state. Um, and it was pretty clear that they were looking the other way, and uh, we were pouring tons of toxic chemicals and waste into our uh, landfills. And um, I'll never forget the hearing we had in, in uh, Lehigh Valley, and uh, Bud and I and Tom Murphy met with uh, this citizen activist, and she had the logs of all the trucks that came in and just pumped this, and they came in from Connecticut. And they had the truck logs, and she had everything organized and down pat. And so the next day, we we get the guy from the Department of Environmental Resources on the line who's responsible. He's the regional director. And Murphy's going, to, did you know on such and such a day and this truck and this day? And he's pounding this guy, pounding him for about a half hour, you know. And the guy's just, I don't know. And on this day, did you, were you aware you signed this document, you know? And it, it was, it was almost like a courtroom, you know, and so then Bud George says, okay, uh, let's move on to the gentleman from Allegheny, Mr. McClovick, you know, and I said, did, on such and such a day did you, and the guy starts crying. I mean, we, he, he basically broke down, and, you know, with the tension and everything, and he's crying, and, and, uh, and we had a <laughs> quickly kind of take a recess here and let him gather his composure and stuff. And, uh, you know, it struck me uh, how, because, you know, I'm just, I, at the time you think you're just a kid that got lucky, got elected, and, you know, but you have important responsibilities. And these were important questions. And we were, uh, you know, we were berating the guy, we were humiliating him in public, and you've got to understand your power. Um, you know, it's significant, and you have a responsibility and a duty to act appropriately. And we weren't, I don't think, in that occasion, even though what what he had done wasn't appropriate either. Uh, so I, uh, to answer your question, the environmental issues, later on uh, I became uh, very involved in communications with uh, the whole uh, uh I, I, I want to use the word divestiture or, or splitting off of Ma Bell into the uh, into four regional uh, bells, the baby bells, and then uh, the long distance carrier and that that whole issue. Um, those were uh, really important issues. Um, I was named to the National uh, uh, Council of State Governments. Uh, Board on communications, so I had to uh, gain some expertise on national on the issue from a national perspective. Um, was very involved with consumer issues on a consumer affairs committee, and uh, it, in some respects, um, I was better off before I was a chairman than after because I had such great committees. I had insurance and environment. I had uh, state government where all the reform issues were there, and I had consumer affairs. And uh, God, there just was a swarm of lobbyists on all the issues of the day coming through your office. Uh, utilities were all consumer affairs. You know, uh, Bill Lloyd, who was a very bright guy from Somerset uh, on that committee, um, and we had stuff going on there. Uh, so there were a lot of a lot of fun issues. Plus, uh, you had the delegation stuff with Allegheny County, and we were pushing. Uh, uh, our proposals, uh, we're trying to, you know, it's a two-way street with the county, too. You're, you're trying to, <clears throat> for example, there would be times I would go up against, even though I was an ally and a friend, a uh, political uh, supporter, and he of me, of Tom Forrester, there were times when I was, I'd be on top of Tom Forrester, uh, badgering him about the mental health fund or this program not running in my district, or, you know, county maintenance and the roads. And um, so it's a, uh, it's, it's a constantly uh, volatile process. And one time you're the receiver, the next time you're the giver. Um, some other things. Uh, the Lobbyist Disclosure Act of 1999. 
Um, Would you like to? I had worked on that. Another long time issue. With, um, Alan Kukovich and I, uh, having come out of Common Cause, kept pursuing those issues, and Alan took the lead on campaign finance uh, reform, and I moved to lobbyist disclosure. And early on, uh, Bob O'Donnell, who became speaker, <coughs> excuse me, was uh, the um, advocate for the ch prime sponsor on lobbyist disclosure. Sometime later, when after he left, when that mantle fell to me, and we finally in '99, um, through um, the good offices of Al, I can't remember his name. Um, legislator from Carlisle, very bright young Maslund. Republican. Pardon. Maslund. Um, Al Maslund, um, uh, who had a lot of respect and uh, in his caucus, uh, he and I teamed up and worked uh, with the Senator Jubilee's staff over in the Senate, and we got a lot of his disclosure passed. Unfortunately, uh, a year or two later, the state Supreme Court um, felt that we were getting into their business of overseeing law, the law, practice of law, and uh, ruled it unconstitutional. Um, and the issue still, for the House of Representatives, still sits today unresolved. How did you work with lobbyists? Uh, I, I was very wary of lobbyists at first. In fact, I, I my, uh, Huck Gamble, particularly Ron Gamble, uh, who's my roommate and longtime uh, uh, friend, I uh, always used to laugh about when I first come up here, I wouldn't even talk to a lobbyist or anything. And years later, I, you know, get along with, <laughs> get along with them. I sure changed over the years. Well, I hope I did. I we all hope we changed to some degree. But um, I got along well with them. And I think one of the things that, um, you know, there's a lot of talk and uh, people are cynical about lobbyists. But um, they are a very important part of the process. And when I was uh, putting in the lobbyist disclosure laws or uh, proposals, I always said this. Lobbyists are extremely important to the system. Without them, I couldn't have on a moment's notice what a deep mind um, uh, issue is or what the technology is. Or they, through this process we've invented here, um, they are they come in with information on um, how much tonnage is, uh, how many jobs are affected, what the technology is, what the safety levels are, you know, and I, that, you couldn't get that information uh, just on your own. Back then, especially when you didn't have internet and uh, Google to check it out, you know, you had to go over to the library and pour through books and stuff, and even then you couldn't find it. So. Um, you know, they're a very important part of the process, and I think they respect uh, when you listen to them and give them a fair hearing, and um, you make a decision, and you tell them, uh, yeah, I'm going to be with you on this one, or I'm against you, and here's why. And, and it's just so they, they know they don't have to spend all their time worrying about your vote, you already told them how you're going to go and follow through with that. And uh, if you te treat people with respect, uh, I think they respect you back. How did you get along with the media? Pretty well, pretty well. I, I was always, uh, you know, I, I think the media kind of favors good government guys, and, and I was always uh, uh, try to, again, be honest with them, uh, give them my opinion. I, I had a lot of uh, conservative media type, particularly rodeo, radio disc jockeys uh, um, that didn't like me for my positions on uh, guns or abortion or uh, any number of things, but hey, not going to please everybody. Well, in 1979, you had the Harrisburg Report, mm -hmm. uh, and that was an hour-long TV show with uh, yes. Ron Cow. Right. Um, when I came up, uh, Ron and I had had a conversation even before I, uh, you know, right after I was elected in the primary, before I was elected in the general, because my seat was very high Democratic seat. I was going to win that general election after I won the primary. Uh, we started talking about, you know, maybe doing some outreach through 
uh, cable television. And cable at that time was just starting this whole notion of a local channel and, and um, you know, with local issues. And so they were looking for, uh, uh, for things to put on that local channel. And uh, so we began talking about doing this, and we, when we come up and researched it, there weren't any cameras around. There weren't any studios. There weren't any um, places to do this. And we found uh, a camera over in the Department of Education. And so we talked to the secretary, and Ron, of course, is a big education guy, and I didn't want to say no to him. Um, and so once a month, we got the use of this camera, and we would march over to the um, the education department go up six or eight floors and with our notes and we'd sit there in front of a camera and, and go through this and, and uh, uh, if you know Ron Kyle, Ron is never for a loss of words, you know, so we filled an hour easily and I, we'd go through a report and simply say, okay, this is what um, the issues were this month and I'd take a you know, a half dozen, he'd take a half dozen, and we'd give a little background on the issue. And then oftentimes we would have a guest, and um, it might be uh, uh, Secretary of Treasury Catherine Baker Knoll, you know, it might be somebody, uh, you know, a fellow colleague that had a piece of legislation. And, you know, we, we got everybody on. Everybody except Ron would not let Alan Kukovich on this show. And, uh, he had this, he wouldn't let Ron, uh, he wouldn't let Alan on, you know. So um, Alan had a show too, and one time we were down. Uh, this is this is long past the time when the single camera over in the Department of Education. We had a studio, and we had some staff to help us. So uh, we were going to be taping a show, and uh, Kukovich was taping his show immediately prior to ours, and um, so. He, he comes in and he's walking on. He says, "You going to do your show?" I says, "Yeah." He says, "Oh," and I said, "We're we're having Secretary of Education Scanlon on," and sure enough, here walk in walks the Secretary of Education. You know, so we sit down and we, we everybody gets mic'd up, and Alan gets gets this sock, and he's interviewing the secretary while, <laughs> and Ron not there yet. And we got the cameras on, and the thing, oh, Mr. Secretary, if I took her, and he's going through his, you know, and Cal got wrong and threw it in his eyes or about this thing. He said, oh, no, Mr. Cal! <laughs> oh, no! <laughs> you know, and, and Ron didn't know what to do or what to say. It was, it was hilarious. It was, another time, uh, we're, we're uh, uh, taping a show. Kukovich is behind the backdrop, and he's throwing pennies over the, you know, and, and Ron did his report, and <laughs> clink, and clinker, the mother man, you know, and we're, what the hell's going on? But uh, there were some good times, some fun. I know now why he was not invited to the no, show. No, <laughs> Kukovich was not <laughs> invited on our show. Well, how did technology during your tenure um, change? Specifically, oh, uh, dramatically, with the computer, through the... Um, uh, 80s and then in the 90s it really just took off with the internet. And remember their computers were around to uh, consolidate and organize and coordinate uh, uh, lists and files and, and I saw the need early on to coordinate th through my legislative work and people and constituents and then apply that on the political side, which is, you know, kind of common sense. And so, uh, in order to be fair about it, I bought a computer for $10,000 in 1982. My own money, I spent 300 bucks a month for 36 months or something um, to pay this thing off. And, you know, it was, it was the first generation. It was a terrible computer by our standards today. It couldn't do anything that I had envisioned on it. And um, so I got, but it, the important thing that I got is uh, a friend of mine who was my, had been my campaign manager and friend, lost his job in the mill. And I was able to get him onto my staff. And he became very interested in working in computers. 
and worked on my computer. And then when other guys started buying them, it would go help them set up in their offices. And today, I'm pleased enough that Jerry Fitzgibbon still works for the House, and that's what he does for Western Pennsylvania. He goes around to the legislative offices and helps the staff and puts in the new technology. Um, but uh, that was uh, really something. In fact, I got into the technology even before that because I came to the floor, and, and we would have a process of amendments, and this tons and tons of paper would come flying over your desk, and, and um, yeah, I said, this is a waste. I said, I mean, we have, we had computer terminals. We could put this on a thermal. You could read. And so I went to Leroy Irvis, and I said, you know, Mr. Irvis, we, can't we put a dummy terminal on, on the table? And he said, young man, I think you have an idea there. I'm going to appoint you to the Committee on Technology, and I got appointed to Secretary of uh, Budget Bob Wilburn was assigned by Thornburg to integrate the state's technology. We had 2,000 different computer lines going out from the Capitol all over the state. Uh, we had instances of three different terminals in the Department of Welfare offices functioning on different programs. And, you know, you, if you wanted to do this program, you worked on this terminal. If you wanted to do that program, you worked on this terminal. Another one, you had to work on that one. And, you know, it's just, and so they were trying to integrate it. And we had this, uh, we were looking into this contract for Boeing to come out here and do it. And it was going to be a multi-million dollar contract, big deal. And um, along came uh, Windows. And that innovation just eliminated the need. Everybody started buying Windows, buying into Windows, and uh, Microsoft and Word and, you know, everything was integrated uh, and the internet started taking off and bingo, we were there. Could, could you talk about your office whenever you first started? Did you have staff? Did you share an office with anyone? Um, I, when I first started, I worked, I uh, shared an office with uh, a guy from um, Munhall. Uh, his name was uh, Bill Knight. We call him Gummy Knight. He was a beloved mayor of Munhall for many, many years, who took uh, Donnie Abraham's place, who was unfortunately a young legislator, elect, first elected in 74, who was killed in a tragic uh, auto accident. And so Gummy took his seat, and Gummy didn't, you know, he, he was an older gentleman. He had no interest in, in you know, he just somehow got a, threw his name in the ring and he got elected. Found out when he came up here he didn't like the job. So every day he would sit there and he would <laughs> throw all the papers on his desk in a trash can <laughs> and put his feet up on his desk and read it. And uh, I looked at him and, and I'm working on all his amendments and uh, issues and trying to read through all his literature and I'm looking at Gummy and he's reading the race in form. What's the horse movie? It's like, wow. <laughs> but uh, um, I shared a, a secretary with uh, Huck Gamble, uh, or no, I'm sorry, with Steve Savani. Uh, and uh, then about a year, or the next term, everybody got their own secretary. And I fortunately wound up with uh, Denise Milas, who uh, served as my secretary for the rest of my career. And still here on the hill. She's a great gal. What are your fondest memories of serving in the House? I think my fondest memories are of the uh, times on the floor um, when, it, you know, the thing about the Pennsylvania leg legislature is uh, very different from Congress. Uh, in Congress, when you take a vote, you get 20 minutes to get down to the floor and vote. You're not, once again, you're not listening to debate, but you're not on the floor. You're meeting with lobbyists or you're meeting with your staff or you're doing this or that, and then you get a buzz and you got to run over to the Capitol to make a vote. In Harrisburg, you're on the floor. You have to be on the floor to vote. And that is the rule. And most members, I mean, there are isolated instances of guys voting other guys and, you know, uh, when they're out of the Capitol. But for the most part, most 
people were in the Capitol complex or, you know, in the men's room or someplace around. And um, so you get a collegiality. I mean, you get to know who your colleagues are, all 203 of them, really. And it's just amazing. Um, you see guys I uh, on the way up here to Harrisburg, I bumped into a colleague I would serve for my first term, you know, some 26, 28 years ago. And, you know, I said, Ken, how are you? He said, I'm Tom McClovey. Oh, yeah, Tom, how you doing? You know, you're, you have that commonality and that respect for coming through this institution. And it is an institution, we have to understand, this is the first and longest continuing democratic institution in the world. And the Pennsylvania House of Representatives. And uh, some great people came through there. And I'm sure there will be some great people to serve here in the future, too. Another way to build camarader camaraderie was through the softball games. Right. And the we, basketball. We would do a lot of, uh, we, we, uh, Bob uh, O'Donnell was a great organizer. He organized softball games. We play the Republics. We play the, the uh, media. We, uh, you know, we play uh, the secretaries or, or staff of uh, the governor's office, you know. And, um, and then we all go out for beers afterwards. And, and have a good time, and then um, foot, we had football games, and, and yeah, we we were yeah you know, we were we were younger guys in our twenties uh, and thirties, and athletic, and uh, we're having a good time. Uh, what do you believe are your greatest accomplishments? I, you know, I was thinking about that coming over here, and I think my greatest accomplishment is representing my people to the best of my ability. And um, I, I also think beyond just, uh, beyond representing, I also reflected them. Um, my sense of, uh, of honesty and fairness and respect um, mirrored the wonderful, wonderful people in the 35th District, the, the work and hard working people. And I can't tell you the number of times I, you know, we would do some innocuous I didn't even know was done. My, you know, staff person would do it. And you know, we, in, into the office would come this little lady with a batch of cookies or, you know, uh, cakes. And uh, or I'd meet somebody on it. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You helped me so much. And I, you know, my staff person did. But you were there. That, and you were the focal point. They came to your office and your, your staff um, treated them with respect didn't poo-poo their issue, and um, and I think that, that's my, my I, I think my most uh, important accomplishment, and I, I still treasure the, uh, the thought when people talk about Tom McClovick, they say he's a good man. Do you have any regrets? Mm, no, not really. Not that I can think of. Are you still active in politics? Uh, yes, I will be active in the governor's race next year. And I'm not in local races so much, but uh, in the statewide offices, certainly. I, I try to do my part and uh, support our candidates. And uh, I have a position now with the uh, Pennsylvania uh, Securities Commission. I'm active uh, with them overseeing uh, the investment and brokerage uh, community and enjoying it. And, and the great thing about that is that I only have to worry about one little slice of public policy, not the whole world and potholes and grievances and problems. I, I just worry about security. Lastly, how would you like to be remembered? Um, I would, that's just that's a, the way my people uh, talk about me and that I, I was a good man I did I did a good job okay well thank you very much this thank concludes you our enjoy interview. it appreciate it